things I've been enjoying for the last 40 years is stained glass. And I started doing stained glass because I thought it was really beautiful, but it was so expensive. And so I took a class and I learned how to do it. And I also learned why it's so expensive. So just for example, if you were coming to me because you wanted me to build you a window, I'd be asking you some important questions. First of all, where would you be putting the window? How big do you want the window? It's important to put the window in a place that gets a lot of light and you can kind of block other access to light so the light is forced through the glass. I have some examples of glass here you can see. And when the light comes through it, it's a little different. That one, not so much. But you see something like this, when you look at it here, it's one thing. But when you look at it through the light, very, very different. And if it's a clear piece, you're seeing right through. And so that's not going to give you any kind of resistance to the light as it comes through the glass. So that's some things I'm going to ask you. But I'm also going to want to know how much detail. So there's a limit to the amount of detail. If you want a piece that is maybe just really tiny. This particular medium that I do, which is called lead cane, it's going to be a little bit harder to make tiny pieces. So most of my windows are large and they have larger pieces, more like about this size or larger. So then I'm going to take uh, graph paper. Oftentimes this is where I'll start and I'll try to decide if they want a window that is maybe two feet by four feet. I'm going to decide that the, each square represents an inch or each square represents four inches. It just depends on how I want to design it. And then I'll do up the design exactly as I want it. Sometimes I'll have a limitation, like I will purchase something called a bevel. In this window, the center piece is a purchased piece of beveled glass. So it's actually clear, a little bit frosty, but the edges are at a slant. So the edges of the glass, about a quarter of an inch to the edge of the glass, it goes into a slant. And this is a diagonal piece, so it has a diamond shape and it has these slanty sides. I use that right in the center of this window because when the sun hits it, it creates rainbows all over the room. And that's pretty cool. So I sometimes like to buy a purchased piece like that. But then that piece becomes the governor for the whole piece because each of the pieces needs to match. It's pretty complicated as you see these diagonal lines. Every line must be the same. Every piece must be the same. So if I get off by just a tiny bit, by the time I get to the edge, I've made a mess. So I, I work it up on this diagram first and see how it fits with this size of a bevel. Then I choose the glass that I want to use for all the other diagonals and I cut them. So accuracy is critical. One of the things when we're going to cut is that I have to leave room for the lead lines. This is the lead. Now this is an H-channel lead, and if you can see right here, the glass is actually going to fit into this channel on each side, like that. Now that's, a, that's an easy fit the straight edges here, but you can see there's a gap between these pieces because I have to cut the pieces so there's room for that channel. That means each piece has to be a little smaller than it's drawn on the pattern. So given that, I have to be very wise about how I cut and I'll often cut out little pattern pieces or I'll use this, something like this, and I can cut right on top because I have light behind it. There's a, this is a, a light box here. And I can lay that on top and I can cut accordingly. If I wanted to cut that piece out, I might uh, first turn it this way. And I want to cut a piece like that so I can... And glass always likes to break in a straight line. 
So because I'm going that way with the curve, it's not such a difficult thing. There, perfect. So I just cut along there. Now there's a little point here that's going to cause me a problem. So then I just grouse it. That's called grousing. So there's no point left. And if it's not enough grousing, oh, no, nope, that's perfect. Now, I didn't cut the whole piece because I'm just using a piece of scrap glass, but that's just an example. Then, because lead is soft, I can wrap this lead around the curves. And I'll use a knife to cut the lead, eventually piecing all the pieces into the pattern with lead between them, and then soldering is the next piece. So... I want to explain a little bit how I ended up with a bigger pattern here and how that works. So this is to scale. I have a specific place where I wanted this. And I was using bevels in the corners, so remember I mentioned you have a limiter there, so I knew exactly how big the boundary parts were going to be. I found this design in a book, and I basically freehanded this according to the limitation of this size that I had left. So I did it a few times until I liked it. But then I had to do the reverse of it for the other one. I wanted them kind of coming together. So you notice the flowers are shaping, uh, facing, this is actually flipped over. So they're facing opposite direction, it's kind of coming together. You'll see that in the kitchen. So it's really the hardest, one of the hardest parts of this is getting this done right. This has got to be a right angle. If I get this off and I do not have a right angle, the rest of the design is ruined. So I've got to get these boards are nailed down to this board. The pattern is nailed underneath. Nothing can move. I need this angle to be so perfect so when I put this glass that I took all that time to cut, it will fit exactly, one piece at a time. First with the zinc outside, which is very strong and works kind of like a frame, and then the glass that fits in here, and then this is, of course, this is not the piece that goes there, I'm just pretending this, and then wrapping that with the lead lines. I'll make the lead line go, you can see the lead line went from here all the way to here. There's a joint here. That means a piece of lead went from here to here. Eventually, this piece will all be soldered together and that's one of the final processes. So, the complication is accuracy. It matters. The angles are super important. Getting the angle wrong, I've done it, and it's really been a disaster. So I usually bring my husband in, who is really good at math and really careful with angles. He works with woodworking, which is a similar um, need for accuracy. And he'll set up these boards and nail them in so they're exactly a right angle right here. Then I can begin. And the other reason he does that is because he often has to install the window or frame it. And if it's not right here, then it's um, kind of difficult later. Okay, so we talked about design, talked about cutting. I've shown you a little bit about leading, which is an involved process. And the next thing would be soldering. I have soldering iron here. Um, so and I, I actually use lead cane solder. And um, so that's an important thing. That's what holds all the joints together. The whole thing becomes one solid piece. That's the amazing thing about stained glass. You start with big pieces of glass, you break them into small pieces, rearrange them, and make them one whole piece. But it's more beautiful than when you started. The final thing that I do is I cement it, and that's so that it can be an indoor-outdoor window. Remember, there was a channel, and in that channel of the lead, water could come in one side and out the other. So we put a, a goo in there to avoid that uh, channel drip. It also darkens the lead. So when you see a stained glass window, all the leads would be black. I use actually tile grout dye, which is really nasty dark black stuff. It's gorgeous to work with. But I put that in my plaster of Paris for the final cleaning up of the window. And then a little Windex to make it perfect at the end. And then we hang it and uh, enjoy it forever.